So this lecture looks like a lot, right? It's 109 slides. It's a lot, but I would typically do this lecture in about two weeks or so. So you can split this up into two sittings if you'd like, because it's kind of like two classes. Uh, but in terms of chemistry, I do cover this entire PowerPoint in good detail. If there's anything that I skimmed over, um, it means I skimmed over it because I'll probably get into it later on in that presentation, or I felt it was probably insignificant. Maybe I thought it was kind of important when I put the PowerPoint together, and then I probably said, you know what, I think I may scratch that. Chemistry is one of those challenging topics because uh, many of you don't have a lot of biochemistry background, and we're not trying to make you to be biochemists. I'm trying to give you a basic foundational understanding. Um, when we talk about chemistry, you'll see that it'll be organized in a way when we start to go through, and you start to go through it, we'll talk about solid, liquid, and gases. We'll talk about some of the elements. And one of the interesting things that you'll get to here, and I can't remember if I talk about it, in this presentation. So if not, I think it's worth mentioning a second time, are these elements. And the elements, most, the, the, the ones that make up the largest portion of the body's mass is gonna be cohen, C-O-H-N -C -O or C-H-O-N, cohen, whichever way you wanna spell it. The C would be for carbon, the H is hydrogen, the O for oxygen, and N for nitrogen, Cohen. But then you have these tiny amounts of trace elements that makes up about 4% of the mass. And what's interesting, you see things like copper, selenium, and zinc. Now, let me just wait for this plane to, to pass by. copper, selenium, and zinc. And although it only makes up 4%, I think it's worth mentioning the significance of these because they are extremely important. And I'm going to stop the screen share. I'm going to see if I can do a whiteboard for a second, see if it gives me that option. Yep. Okay. So... Can you all see my, uh, if you can't see this, please open up your, you know, your mics and let me know. I'm going to draw something here. Can you see the circle that I just drew? Just someone say yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. beautiful, perfect. So let's say this is a cell. I know we haven't talked about the cell yet, but since we're getting into chemistry, um, I want you to just assume this is a cell right in the middle. There's a nucleus. And on the outside, I'm going to make a, a cell membrane. And notice I'm making it two layers, like a double layer. Uh, this double layer right here is considered to be a phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer. Two layers. And... Outside of it, if I go from here outward, and let's say I drew another cell right here, again with this phospholipid bilayer, um, everything between the cells, there's going to be fluid between the cells. They call that extracellular fluid. And then any fluid that may be inside the cells, that would be intracellular fluid. So extra is outside, intra is inside, intracellular, extracellular. The other name for extracellular fluid out here is known as interstitial fluid. Interstitial, I-N-T-E-R-S-T-I-T-I-A-L, interstitial fluid. Now, <clears throat> one of the organelles besides the nucleus would be the infamous mitochondria, right? So I'm going to draw this with the matrix inside, and I'll put an M there just to remind you that that is the mitochondria. 
And the mitochondria is responsible for what? Who remembers? Who knows from like a high school biology class? Anyone can chime in. It's okay. What does the mitochondria do? What do you know about it? Anyone? Yeah, say it again. It gives energy. It gives energy, right? It produces energy. Um, What is that energy source called? Does anyone know what the energy? ATP. ATP. What does ATP stand for? Adenosine triphosphate. Thank you. Adenosine triphosphate. So the whole idea of the mitochondria is to help us produce energy, energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate. And mitochondria resemble bacteria. In fact, there is a theory that mitochondria may very well be bacteria that have learned to live symbiotically with us. And as a result of this symbiotic relationship of this uh, microorganism learning to live within ourselves, it has some major important function, and that function would be to provide us with energy. Now, we consume food in the form of carbohydrates and proteins and fats, and when we consume something that has protein, carbohydrates, and fats, let's say you consumed a avocado and an avocado has some really good fat in it, but it's not like the avocado goes in your mouth and instantly it becomes energy for us. Uh, If you were to consume a porterhouse steak, It's not like that protein, once it hits the mouth, is broken down immediately into amino acids and becomes energy for us. It's just not the case. So uh, carbohydrates are broken down eventually into glucose and proteins are broken down into amino acids and fats are broken down into triglycerides. And when they do, it produces a... um, it produces something that the mitochondria can use to help produce energy, okay? Now, the first step of energy production, the body takes something like this. Um, Let me see if I can find my eraser here. Okay, let's... Again. Okay, uh, let's let me get my pen here, see if I can get it. Hmm. Hold on, I lo- uh, lost my pen a second. Here we go. Nope. That's not it. Okay, so Let's say this is a six carbon sugar, right? You can count the carbons with me, right? You can see you've got one, two, three carbons here, and then you have three carbons on the other side. So you have a six carbon sugar. That's called glucose. And what's going to happen is this bond right here and this bond right here, you're gonna learn all about bonds in today's lecture, is going to break right there. When we break something apart, you'll hear the word lysis, L-Y-S-I-S. You'll hear the word lysis. When we're specifically breaking glucose down, the process is called glycolysis, glycolysis. That's this right here, taking the six carbon sugar, breaking that bond, so we're left with something that looks like this. It's two, 
three carbon sugars, right? All we did was break that bond in between. And now we're left with something called pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Now, this breaking down of glucose is essential for the mitochondria to start to produce energy in the form of ATP. But this step here of glycolysis is taking place here in the cytoplasm. Cyto, cytoplasm, cytoplasm. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. Now that's going from that six carbon sugar glucose to these two three carbon sugars pyruvate. Now in the presence of oxygen, as long as you're not out of breath and like this huffing and puffing, and you have good oxygen available, that pyruvate can enter into the mitochondria. And when pyruvate enters into the mitochondria, the second step of energy production takes place. We're going to say energy production happens in three steps. So let's say one, I'll put a G for glycolysis. We'll put two. The second step, I'll put a K for the Krebs cycle. Sometimes that Krebs cycle is called oxidative phosphorylation, OP, oxidative phosphorylation. And then the third step, we'll call it the electron transport chain, the ETC. So energy production, I like to think of it as three steps, glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm. Then the Krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation takes place within the mitochondria. And then the electron transport chain also takes place in the mitochondria. Now, where am I going with this, right? Because that whole thing about copper, selenium, zinc with the trace elements brought me into discussing this. So when your body is producing energy, the O in oxidative phosphorylation, the O is oxidative. That could potentially be damaging to the mitochondria and to the site into the cell membrane of the cell. So we want to make sure that we have something to offset the oxidative stress. Think of oxidative stress as little bullets going off within the body, but they're bullets that the body makes. And we need something to protect us against the bullets or the oxidative stress. What do you think we need internally to offset the oxidative stress? Who wants to take a guess at it? Um, I think you need something to reduce the oxygen. Okay, so let's keep it, let's keep it simple. You're, you're certainly going in the right track. So let's give it a name. If something is an oxidant, what can we consume internally to combat the oxidant? What do we call it if you're against oxidants? Uh, reducer? No. Nope. Antioxidant? Ah, there we go antioxidants all right so have you heard of that term before oh this food is high in antioxidants or that food is high in antioxidants right usually colorful foods things of the rainbow red orange yellow green blue indigo violet everything on that spectrum is high in antioxidants so within the cytoplasm of the cell we have something called copper, zinc, superoxide dismutase. That is an antioxidant system. Copper, zinc, superoxide dismutase. That is found within the cytoplasm of the cell. Within the mitochondria, I'm going to draw an arrow here. So within the mitochondria, we have something called manganese superoxide dismutase. So mitochondria by themselves, if you're doing nothing, just sitting, thinking, 
still your heart is beating, your brain is thinking. So the mitochondria of the brain and the mitochondria of the heart are producing ATP for us, which means they have to be giving off oxidative stress, but it's doing so at a pace that our bodies can actually quench and to you know, tolerate the rate at which those oxidants are being produced so that the body innate intelligence can quench it, neutralize it, if you think of it that way. But what happens if you're doing some HIIT training, some high intensity training, where you're doing some intense lifting and squats and burpees and mountain climbers and bear walks and, and then lunges and then overhead squats, right? And you're doing all these heavy moves and your heart is beating and you're perspiring and then you're doing, you know, biking and then speed walking and then push ups and you're just challenging your system and your heart is beating so fast and you're out of breath, right? Your mitochondria are working so hard to produce enough energy that the amount of oxidative stress could be overwhelming. And if you're not a healthy individual, you may not have enough built-in antioxidant system to quench and deal with the oxidative stress. And when you have this imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants, oxidants win. And you could damage your DNA. You can damage cell membranes. You could do a whole lot of harm to your body. Uh, I have known people who have ran marathons 26 miles and have died the next day. Sometimes the most athletic people that I know are the most unhealthy. They may look physically fit, right? There's the difference. People can look chiseled and have like um, be muscular fit and athletically fit and be toned on the exterior, but yet the insides are very, very unhealthy. And I find that to be true when I take care of my patients and I analyze them biochemically and I look at their biochemistry, most athletes are not very healthy internally. And we try and make them aware of that. So here's just the perfect case where you could look at the importance of some of these minerals that, you know, these trace elements, 4%, copper, zinc, even selenium, I didn't even mention selenium, but selenium is really, really important for the, for a major antioxidant within the body called glutathione. Have you ever heard of glutathione before? Thumbs up if you have. Very few have, I'd be surprised. This is one of the things that you know but you didn't know that you knew it, okay? This is gonna be one of those things. So let me ask you this, when you're not feeling well, what vitamin would, would Ma want you to take? If you weren't feeling well, what would she give you vitamin-wise to help you heal up from a common cold? I didn't say Ah, see, I told you all this is one of the things that you knew that you didn't know that you knew. Exactly, vitamin C. And what is vitamin C's claim to fame is that it's an antioxidant. Well, this is true. Vitamin C is extremely needed to help recycle the most important antioxidant to human beings. That most potent, powerful antioxidant is one that seems to be reduced in just about everyone that has COVID. Okay, and that is called glutathione, glutathione, G-L-U-T-A-T-H-I-O-N-E, glutathione. Now, glutathione is pretty amazing stuff. We have the ability to actually make it and generate it within our own bodies. If you have the right ingredients and you're healthy. So what do we need to make glutathione? We need complete protein in our diet. We need three major 
amino acids to come together to produce glutathione. Those three amino acids, right? You consume protein and protein are broken down into amino acids. The three amino acids are glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. I'll say it again, glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. Cysteine is C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, cysteine. Now, I learned of cysteine many years ago. Um, I was doing CrossFit pretty intensely many, many years ago. And one of the supplements that someone recommended to me was NAC, N-A-C. I said, what is this NAC? And it stands for N-acetylcysteine. And I started doing some research into it, and it's the cysteine that's associated with one of the three amino acids, right? Glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. In the supplemental form, it's called NAC, N-A-C, N-acetylcysteine. And it's the weak link. It's the weak link of those three amino acids that we need in order for our bodies to produce enough glutathione. Glutamine is usually not an issue in the American diet, and glycine is not an issue, but cysteine, however, is a sulfur-containing amino acid, and that's sometimes hard to get. A lot of people aren't uh, eating their Brussels sprouts and love broccoli and onions and cauliflower and things of that nature, so a lot of sulfur-containing foods have cysteine in it, and because that's the weak link of the three amino acids, Many of my patients supplement with NAC. Now, you need to have complete protein in your diet. Now, remember this saying, because it'll be a gem, and it's one that you're going to want to remember. Most people have heard the expression, you are what you eat. Haven't you heard people say that? You know what they say, you are what you eat, and that's not true. It's you are what you can break down, right? If a infant or a toddler swallows a quarter or they swallow a penny or a marble. Does that quarter or that marble become the child or do they poop it out later that day? They poop it out, right? Why do they poop it out? Because they couldn't digest it. They didn't have the digestive enzymes to break it down to become there to even get glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. Now, if you do have a healthy diet, you have strong digestive enzymes and your body can break those proteins into amino acids, beautiful, perfect. Now you can make glutathione, that powerful antioxidant system. But now you need to consume foods with vitamin C to recycle the glutathione. Remember, glutathione is like the bulletproof vest that's getting hit with bullets and now we need something to pull out the bullets to recycle that bulletproof vest. Glutathione is the bulletproof vest and vitamin C recycles it so that glutathione can go back to war and take more hits for us. And we are a mammal that can't produce vitamin C. It's an essential nutrient. So if it's not in your diet, you got to supplement it. Okay. So now... We go back and we think, okay, so these trace elements, man, we haven't even talked about carbon yet, hydrogen, oxygen, and we haven't talked about the 96% of the human body. We just focused on the tiny, teeny, itsy, bitsy 4%. Copper, zinc, selenium is key. Selenium is really needed to help with the production of glutathione. Vitamin C is needed to recycle it. Okay. Now, if you're training really hard and exercising hard, you're producing more energy. There's also more exhaust that the mitochondria are giving off. That exhaust is oxidative stress. That's where, that's where all that healthy diet and healthy foods are needed. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, 
let's see what else I wanted to cover. Let me go back and let's look at that PowerPoint for a second. Okay, let me go back to a screen share here for you. Okay. Okay, so uh, I do go over all of this about chemical bonds with you in the lecture, so I'm not going to take the time here to go over that. We do go over the octet rule. I do go over free radicals. So free radicals is oxidative stress. When you see this term free radicals and what can create it, that is oxidation. And that's why we want antioxidants. So uh, make sure you focus in and pay attention when I cover that in the lecture. We talk about ionic bonds and covalent bonds quite a bit and the hydrogen bond. I will mention uh, chemical reactions. the difference between synthesis reactions and decomposition. Synthesis reactions are also known as anabolism, and that is building up. And decomposition is catabolism or the breaking down. So when you think of these two, anabolism is the body's ability to take something smaller and build it up, whereas catabolism is taking something larger and being able to break those things down. And when we talk about um, the difference between catabolism and anabolism, you'll hear me talk about dehydration synthesis versus hydrolysis, two different chemical reactions. So please pay attention to that. Um, I will go into detail with reversible reactions in the lecture. Going from AB and breaking it down into A plus B or... A plus B going into AB. In the human body, the body's always going back and forth, back and forth in terms of pH. pH stands for either potential hydrogen or percent hydrogen. And the body has the ability of always adapting and adjusting to shift and change the body's pH, but keeping it in a very, very tight window. Uh, when we talk about pH of the body, let me see if I can show you a, uh, the whiteboard again for a second. When we talk about pH, the pH scale goes from zero all the way up to 14. And right in the middle is seven. And who knows what the body's blood pH is? Who wants to take a shot at that? Anyone want to take an educated guess? Blood pH. You can unmute yourself if you like. Anyone know? Okay, that's fine. Blood pH is somewhere. Uh, I think it's. Okay. I think blood pH is. I think it's almost neutral, but I think it's a little bit more on the acidic side. No, no, I think it'll be more on the basic side. I think it'll be about somewhere between seven and eight, I think. Okay, pretty close, pal. Pretty good. So we're looking at 7.35 to 7.35. 4 or 5. So we're looking right around here, right? Around 7.4. That is the normal pH of blood, which is anything from 0 to 6.999999. That's what we call an acid. And anything above 7 to 14, that's what we call a base or an alkaline. And I will go into this again in this lecture when we talk about electrolytes and we talk about acids and bases and 
Um, so just generally speaking, anything from zero to 6.99 is an acid. Anything from uh, in the middle, right in the center is neutral. Above 7.0 to 14 is a base also known as an alkaline. So our body has the ability, if the body's becoming too acidic, we breathe quickly, right? We see this a lot happening now where if you're wearing the mask too often, like this, right, and you're breathing in your own carbon, your own carbon dioxide, shift your pH of your body and drive you into metabolic acidosis. That becomes dangerous. This is when people develop bad, bad headaches, not good. So mass breaks are really, really important because if you think about cellular respiration, let me stop my screen share for a second. And let's go into my, one of my last few slides of the PowerPoint. It's pretty relevant. Let's go into the screen share now. Okay, so if we look, this is one of the last, like, slide 106. Look what we're supposed to do, right? We breathe in oxygen. We give off CO2. What's giving off CO2? The mitochondria, right? We breathe in oxygen. That oxygen oxidizes the glucose. It helps to break it down. And each time it breaks it down, a carbon is going to hook up with an oxygen and you're going to give off CO2. We're supposed to expel that, not breathe it back in, right? We take in oxygen, give off CO2. The trees take in the CO2 that we give off and give us oxygen. It's that beautiful harmonic relationship. So a lot of issues arise in terms of acid-base balance when that is thrown off in the body, especially with bicarbonate and carbonic acid within the human body. And this is why many people can breathe and breathe quickly when you're exercising. There is a high degree of oxidation. The body becomes a little bit more acidic and the body tries to push out more CO2 to neutralize the pH of the body and restore it back to like 7.4, okay? All right, let me just see what else we want to focus on here. So in this lecture, uh, pay attention to that acid base uh, bicarbonate, which is a base carbonic acid relationship. And then we're going to get into inorganic compounds versus organic compounds. When we talk about um, inorganic compounds, we're going to focus primarily on water because there are many things that um, function in harmony with water in the body. So you're going to review acid, bases, and salts once again in relationship to pH. I do cover the pH scale once again. And you can look at all the different pHs. You could see here stomach acid, pretty, pretty acidic stuff. Here is blood around 7.4. Uh, tomatoes, grapes, milk, vinegar. <clears throat> then when you get into organic compounds, this is where you're going to focus on a long carbon chain with hydrogens attached. You'll be learning about functional groups, different functional groups associated with the organic compounds. And then I'll talk about carbohydrates and I'll talk about fats or lipids, the different categories. And when we do fats, we'll talk a little bit about eicosanoids. Let's see if I can Stop on that slide for a second here. Icosanoids. And right on top here, see where it says 
cell membrane, right here is actually that phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So this right here is the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, and there is an enzyme called phospholipase. Phospholipase is going to act on the phospholipid bilayer and pull out arachidonic acid from the cell membrane. Now you can see arachidonic acid has enzymes, anything that ends in ASE, here is cyclogenase, and there's lipoxygenase, they end in ASE. Anything that ends in ASE is an enzyme, anything that ends in OSE is a sugar. So cyclogenase acts on arachidonic acid and produces prostocyclins, thromboxane, and PGE2. These are all involved with natural process of inflammation. If you sprain an ankle, if you cut yourself, um, if you have a lesion of any sort within your body, the body has to heal itself. And the first sign of healing is inflammation. So we want the body to be able to become inflamed to heal. The problem is when inflammation exists, for an extended period of time. Acute inflammation is great, you know, 24 to 72 hours, that's fine. Chronic inflammation, something that lasts two months, three months, four months, is very detrimental to the human body. Most chronic diseases stem from long chronic states of inflammation. So inflammation is really important to manage. Acute inflammation, good, stress. So we want to make sure, we want to make sure that you have a good amount of antioxidants. And again, you can see here the oxygen that you breathe in from your nose, that oxygen is going to come in to the mitochondria. And the exhaust that the mitochondria gives off is CO2, carbon dioxide. And that's the exhaust that we need to give off and not recycle. Very important. Now, in the absence of oxygen, pyruvate can go into another sugar called lactate or lactic acid. So if you're exercising and you're completely out of breath, you have no more energy left, your body's going to collapse, you're going to take a five-minute break, get your oxygen levels up, then lactic acid can become recycled back into pyruvic acid and pyruvic acid can now enter the mitochondria, okay? Uh, one of the foods that they consume, they wanna make sure there's not a lot of cholesterol in it, but I think it's really important that you understand that the majority of your serum or blood cholesterol is produced by your own livers, and your livers produce it predominantly at night. Now, cholesterol makes up about 20% of your cell membrane. It makes up about 20% of the fat and the structure of your brains. So when people have high cholesterol, it's not as bad as people think, believe me. It's people jump and they go, oh my God, my cholesterol is so high, I'm going to have a heart attack, I'm going to get a stroke. And that's not necessarily the case. If someone's cholesterol is over 320, 323, and they have poor lifestyle habits, there's going to be a problem. But there is significant amount of evidence and research showing that the higher the cholesterol, the longer people live. It's if the cholesterol is high and you're a smoker. It's if it's high and you do high-intensity exercise without antioxidants. It's if your cholesterol is high and you're doing drugs and alcohol and eating fried foods and that's where the problems arise. That's where the healthy cholesterol that your body produces becomes damaged. That becomes a major problem. So when we look at uh, cholesterol, there's LDLs and HDLs. And that's also misunderstood. Some people think HDL, the H in HDL for happy and 
the NL deal is for loser and it's the bad one. And that's really not, um, your livers produce cholesterol and that cholesterol that it produces and pushes it out to your body's tissues is called LDL, low density lipoprotein. And then the cholesterol that your body doesn't use, it's going to be taken from the tissues and brought back to the liver for storage. And those are the HDLs that do that. The problem is when the LDLs become oxidized, there's that word again, meaning fried foods, alcohol, high sugar, refined carbohydrates in your diet, um, eating foods that are burnt, you know, like barbecue stuff that's, you know, has fats on it that's all burnt and you like to eat the burnt stuff, um, uh, frying things. Very, very bad. High carbohydrates in your diet, especially the refined stuff, very damaging. High blood sugar, very damaging. It oxidizes that LDL. That becomes a major, major problem. That's what creates heart attacks and strokes. Not just the cholesterol by itself. It's if you have the death style associated with it, right? Have a lifestyle and then there's death style stuff. So there are people that are just genetic producers of high cholesterol and they live a very, very long time. It's they become oxidized, there's a problem. So there's a way of measuring oxidized LDL. So you just do some blood work. So here's what I wanted to show you. When people take medication, let me just make sure you guys can still hear me and can you guys still hear me okay just say hello or say yes 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 okay okay good i just got a uh, internet unstable warning so i want to make sure you guys are are still there we'll finish this up in just a few minutes there is about a quarter of the population that use statins to decrease cholesterol that's cholesterol lowering medication uh, Simvastatin, Arvastatin, Lipitor, Crestor. Those are drugs that many people use to decrease the amount of cholesterol that people produce. So we start off with acetyl-CoA, and then that becomes HMG-CoA. And HMG-CoA has an enzyme that's going to act on HMG-CoA, and that's called HMG-CoA reductase. Statins block that enzyme. Remember, anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. So the statins block that enzyme so that you see all the way down at the bottom, there's cholesterol, you can't produce it. So some would think that's a good thing. But you need cholesterol to produce hormones. Look at the word cholesterol. What about estrogen, progesterone? testosterone, all the sex hormones come from cholesterol. Without cholesterol, you can't make vitamin D. You can't make steroid hormones without cholesterol. You can't make the cell membrane. You can't make phospholipids to support the cell membrane. But one other really important thing becomes a major problem. Look all the way to the bottom right, coenzyme Q10. Anyone in the class ever hear of CoQ10 or know anything about it? Please chime in if you know anything about CoQ10 or coenzyme Q10. Nobody. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about CoQ10. CoQ10 is needed by the mitochondria. What does the mitochondria do? Tell me again. What does the mitochondria do? Produce. Does it produce? Energy. energy. You know what it needs to produce energy? CoQ10. It's needed by the electron transport chain. Remember the, in energy production, I said three phases, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is very dependent on CoQ10 to make ATP. And most of your energy production takes place at that last phase called the electron transport chain. It's like 34 ATP or so is produced there. So if the person is taking a statin, not only are they lowering their body's cholesterol, but they're lowering their body's ability to make coenzyme.